Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Field Crop Team's virtual breakfast. My name is Eric Anderson. I'm a Field Crops educator based in the southwest part of the state. I'll be your host this morning. First up, we'll hear from MSU Extension Field Crop Pathologist, Dr. Marty Chilvers, who will discuss tar spot in corn and white mold in soybean and other crops. Next, Dr. Jeff Andreessen, our ag climatologist, will give us an update of how the weather has impacted us this past week and what the forecasts are ahead of of us. Uh, we'll conclude the morning with an open time of Q&A, so you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of other specialists and field staff. If you have any questions at any time during the morning, please type those into the chat box through the link at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the morning, Phil Cates will give us all the details for receiving the RUP credit at the end of the presentation. So with that, Marty, I will turn things over to you. Thanks, Eric, uh, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, so uh, as Eric said, I'll talk about tar spot uh, primarily, I think. Uh, but I'll mention uh, white mold here at the, at the top just to cover a couple of little points. I think it might be helpful. Uh, so we do a lot of white mold um, trials at the Montcalm Research Farm, looking at fungicide efficacy, fungicide timing, variety selection, uh, and whatnot. So I just want to share a couple of results from um, 2019. And one of those that I think is, is pretty critical to managing white mold is variety selection. Um, and what, what we're looking at here is a number of different varieties, um, just tagged with their maturity group number um, against their white mold disease severity score along the bottom there and the amount of yield uh, that we got off each of those different varieties. Um, so I just want to demonstrate that it is possible to find varieties even in areas with really high disease pressure rate. From this photo you can see aerially here, there's a lot of white mold pressure in this particular field, there's a lot of browned out. Uh, plots in there, uh, but even in a, a field like that, it's got pretty significant pressure. There are varieties that can, you know, really um, have better better resistance to white mold than others. So this top left group of uh, varieties here have a pretty low uh, white mold disease score, uh, and consequently a pretty reasonable yield, uh, as opposed to those in the bottom right of this graphic here that had scored very high in terms of disease pressure. Uh, and consequently their, their yield suffered as well. Okay, so uh, just, you know, at the start of the season or as you start thinking about seed orders uh, coming up, make sure you speak with your sales uh, people. Um, and then I just want to mention Sporecast, so just in case you're not familiar with that. Um, and so this was developed at Wisconsin with uh, data and assistance from Michigan State. So what it does is predict the risk of white mold apothecia. It's not predicting final white mold, but the risk of those white mold mushrooms, which are shown in the bottom uh, left hand uh, picture there. So I did want to put that picture in there because there are a lot of other fungi that are out there, a lot of other mushrooms, and people very often confuse uh, bird's nest fungus with uh, the white mold uh, apothecia. This is about a quarter inch uh, cross, and it, it's, it's uh, sort of got a cup shape to it and a little stalk. Uh, bird's nests look like little drums that will open up and it'll look like a tiny little bird's nest with these large uh, balls of um, spores in there. Uh, so Sporecast is free to download, so get in there and play with it, and it's pretty easy to use. Basically, you click new field, you can uh, use GPS to put a location in or scroll around on the map and, and find a location that you'd like to um, look at in terms of risk. Um, I just ran it last night. Um, this is for, I just chose pigeon. Michigan. Um, so the left hand picture here is just a capture of my phone um, and it's showing very low risk in dry land, 15 inch um, soybeans up in the Pigeon area of Michigan. Um, so that's July 2020. Um, on the right hand side here I just went back a couple of years um, and asked in 2016 how was our risk for that particular area and it was it was above threshold uh, according to the model where it 49% our risk. And our current threshold here is set at 30%. You can actually apply with this if you wanted to apply with the action threshold, you know, when basically we, we light up from a, a very low risk situation to a high risk situation, if you wanted to play with that. And just finally too, if you're looking for um, additional resources in terms of fungicides, um, we have something called the Crop Protection Network. So that's a, a coalition of pretty much all of the land grant universities across the US and Ontario, Canada. Um, and we come together and we compare notes on how different fung uh, fungicides work for us and compile that into a fungicide efficacy chart. 
right. So if you go to the Crop Protection Network, just Google that term, um, you'll get to this website and you'll be able to pull up a, a PDF that has all the different fungicides that we've screened um, and their ranking, whether they rank from fair um, to excellent in terms of performance for white mold management um, and whether they're, they're labelled or not. We have a bit of information there as well. Spend the rest of the time talking about tar spot. That's probably uh, more of a concern uh, this season. So it's a pretty new disease for Michigan, right? It's only been here for about three, four years now. Um, and as, as the name suggests, it looks like tar has been just flecked onto those. Um, this is a close-up of a tar spot lesion. So the top side of the leaf is, is on the top of the screen. We're cutting through the leaf here. And just for a scale too, here's uh, four, four thousandths of an inch, right? So we're looking at something that's blown up, you know, quite a lot underneath the microscope here. And basically, whenever you look at those tar spot structures, you're looking at these little um, fungal reproductive structures, right? And they're producing spores in here that get exuded out um, onto the leaf surface and then get rain splashed and wind carried from um, plant to plant and from field to field. So that's how it's getting about. In terms of the life cycle then, um, it's, it's essentially here in the lower half of Michigan, right? Um, and I'll, I'll show you a map of that in a second. But where it's coming from is infected corn debris on the ground. Um, and unfortunately, this, the spores can move some distance. So even if you're doing everything right in terms of crop rotation, um, it's not going to mean that you're going to escape this disease. We have potential for those spores to move in from outside, from neighboring, neighboring areas. So essentially, we get an infection of that, that corn, and then two to three weeks later, we can, get, um, we can go from uh, one infection to you know, it, it's beginning to multiply, releasing more spores and infecting the plant again. Uh, in terms of identification, um, you know, insect frass or insect poop can be pretty often um, confused with tar spot. The one thing you can do is see if that, that black spot will rub off of the plant. Sometimes you need a little bit of water and a little bit of rubbing to sort of get those spots off. Um, but if it's insect poop, it should just rub straight off the, off the leaf. And the other thing you can look for for tar spot is those lesions tend to um, be on the top side and on the underside of the leaf. So that one lesion should, should push all the way through. So flip the leaf over and have a look. And the only other thing I can really think of that has sort of a dark uh, appearance to it is common rust just later in the season. Common rust starts out as very orange, but later in the season we get these sort of teleospores that, that have a dark appearance. But they've got more of a ruptured appearance to them, not a, a different sort of look to, to the tar spot. And they should sort of rub off to some extent uh, as a black. Okay, so in terms of tar spots history in Michigan then, or, or in the US, is first found in Indiana, Illinois, and has since spread from there, okay. Um, so these light colors show the, the sort of first um, counties that it was found in. Um, Allegan County was it for us in, in Michigan uh, back in 2016, and since then it, it's spread, right. In 2018, we had pretty severe losses because we had a lot of rainfall uh, in July and August. So we had these sort of perfect conditions for tar spot to really amp up um, and do some damage. 2019 was quite dry uh, mid-July and August, and so that really put the brakes on tar spot, and that's probably what we're seeing more or less this season as well, sort of a slowing of, of disease progression. But uh, the tar spot was, um, pathogen was able to continue spreading, and it was found out, um, out in the thumb region. Um, and in some of those thumb regions, it's only, it was only a field here or there, or, or, or very, very late in the season. But what it's doing is basically spreading across you know, lower Michigan and now it's a little bit more ready to get going and, and cause more of a more damage this season potentially. Um, and here's where we are for 2020. Um, and you can go to this uh, website, just Google corn IPM and, and click through the links, IPM pipe, and click through the links for Taskbite. And I mean, essentially, like I said, it's across lower Michigan, and I fully expect it's, it's present in these counties around Detroit. Um, but we are just, you know, putting in there when, when we do find it this season, just to give you a heads up to get out and scout. But, you know, you should get out and scout anyway, uh, especially now. Now's a really good time to be, be really watching for this disease. Um, like pretty much all diseases, you know, our number one go-to tool will be hybrid resistance or... or um, Difference in susceptibility, no variety is completely resistant, uh, but varieties do um, show differences in susceptibility or partial resistance. So that's where we, where we want to get to. Um, and we are certainly weeding out some of those varieties that are really susceptible. I've already mentioned this, go to that Crop Protection Network um, and have a look for 
uh, the fungicide efficacy. I'm not going to list the, the different fungicides that we have, but um, go to this website and you can have a look. We were pretty reluctant to really break things out too much based on one year's um, data, um, but I'm, I'm, after this year, I'm sure we'll be starting to sort of make finer um, scale sort of scoring of different products. But I think the most important thing is thinking about timing. Um, there's, there appears to be some differences in products, but timing I think is going to be far more critical. So what we're looking at here is dry matter accumulation in corn. Okay. Um, typically, when we're talking about fungicide applications, we've had that discussion over the years of vegetative application versus our you know, R1 silking application for the most part. Um, so this yellow line here is grain fill um, or dry matter accumulation in the grain, right? And so that continues, it initiates at R1, obviously, as, as we start to get fertilization, but really, you know, ramps up and continues uh, even once we hit the beginning of dent. Um, and so it's really important to have, you know, as much protection as we can, you know, until we hit black layer, essentially. Um, and with Tarspot, this might change our thinking about the timing of, of fungicide application. You know, that, that R1 application may not always be best. Uh, we may need to delay until R3 or R4, potentially, uh, depending on the season. Um, because most fungicides, you know, typically only have a two, three week window uh, where they're doing a really good job of protecting foliage. And after that, you know, disease can start moving in again. So with, you know, a couple of months to protect there of, of foliage, we really need to be thinking about just very briefly, this is some data from last year. Again, Tarspot was really late to get going last year as well, but it does really point out that those very early applications, um, what we're looking at here is the amount of disease. Um, those early applications really didn't do much. So we've got a non-treated check here on the far left, V6, uh, V8 and V10. As we start to head into that uh, VTR1 timings, we get you know, the better suppression of disease. But this year we're really asking, what, what do we need to do to go beyond that R1 timing? So we're looking at R3, R4 uh, and even R5 timings this year to get a better handle on that. Um, and one of the experiments that I have set up this year is trying to develop a threshold. And this is my best guess at this point in time. Um, so I think if we've got less than one in 100 plants infected, I think we should probably wait and watch in terms of task plot, right? And we don't want to forget about other diseases. Um, and you've got to scout pretty regularly, right? Because this thing can get moving pretty quickly and you can, you can be surprised uh, pretty easily. So I really got to be careful with this. My thinking this year, I have plots out there. Um, what we're going to do is wait until we hit about a 50% uh, plants infected threshold. And I don't mean covered in task spot would be too late by then, but I'm, I'm meaning one or two spots on a plant can, you know, constitutes um, infection. Um, and once we get to 50% of plants infected, and I'm thinking I might have to adjust this to ear leaf and above, once we get to that, then I'm going to pull the trigger and make a spray. And I'm going to compare that this year to just a, a standard application at R1, and I'll have the data at the end of the season to, to tell you how that panned out. But that's my plan. It's really going to count on us being able to get out to these locations across the state and scout pretty regularly because I don't want to miss that infection window. Um, but that, that's our plan at this point in time. Again, don't forget about other diseases. You know, we're right in the window potentially now to try and manage um, ear molds as well. There's some interesting data coming out of Ontario talking about a 50% reduction in, um, in ear molds. That seems a bit high to me, but hey, we'll, we'll see when the data gets published. Um, I think maybe a 30% reduction is probably more on par with what we see um, in a good year. And just very briefly then, um, you know, weather is a really big driver here, right? Um, so if we get a lot of rainfall um, come the end of this month or August, that's really going to drive um, tar spot development. And of course, if you're irrigating, you want to try and minimize leaf wetness. Um, and we will talk about leaf wetness in a couple of weeks too with um, uh, hybrid resistance, of course, scouting. Crop rotation might help. Residue management might help. But they're pretty small pieces of this puzzle. It's more about getting out there and making sure we've got fungicide at the right time. And then if we do develop pretty si significant tasks, like get out and scout for lodging potential. You may need to harvest those uh, fields at risk from lodging a little bit earlier. Um, and with that, I just want to thank these people and the Corn Marketing Board. And I'll leave it at that and probably take questions at the end. There are a few questions in. Uh, we'll, we'll cover those now. And then if we get any new ones, then we can take those later. So 
Um, the first couple have to do with uh, white mold. So does MSU have any plans to reinstate the uh, Southwest testing program for soybean varieties? Yeah, not my area. Um, Southwest. So I know a number of like, just in general, I know a number of locations um, may have been dropped this year with the COVID restrictions and, and trying to get into campus to, to work and count seed and whatnot. I imagine that that would be back up and running next year. Okay. And then there are a couple of questions about spore caster specifically. Uh, yeah. how, would you, how would you adjust the spore caster model for dry beans? Uh, reduce action threshold to what value? I wouldn't necessarily um, change the action threshold. Um, it was set at 40 previously and it was reduced to 30 uh, this year and that just sort of got pushed out um, as an update. I, I think I would use that as is. And the other thing I think you want to really pay attention to is that um, that percentage chance of finding those white mold mushrooms. So that's that little number that's, that's given to you, right? Zero to a hundred. Um, just pay attention to that and see, see what that number's doing. And I think another really important thing or helpful thing for you to do, you can run back about five years worth of weather data. So run it for today and then scroll back a year, rerun the model and see what the risk was. And, you know, use your knowledge of that field to, to gauge how you think pressure was last year or the previous years, um, as opposed to this year. And I got that question wrong before. So the, the question about the, the soybean trials, the variety trials, that was for white mold. So the white mold trials. Oh, we're doing, we're doing that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. So the, um, yeah, so we were doing the soybean performance trial was doing braiding of varieties up in um, Sanilac sort of area from the, um, from the performance trial side of things. It's an incredible amount of work to do that. Um, we're doing more of that variety testing now um, at the Montcalm Research Center. Um, and we have trials for a number of companies and we give that information back to the companies. So um, that's where that is at this point in time. But yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, yeah. Is the spore caster model, is that useful for predicting any other diseases besides white mold? So we're adjusting, so the spore caster framework, um, again, developed by my colleague, Damon Smith at Wisconsin, um, that was developed around, essentially what it's doing is taking a 30 day moving average um, of the weather up until today. And it's looking at the weather, a couple of weather parameters to predict risk, right? And for, for white mold mushrooms, it is, um, let me see, I think it's uh, humidity, and temperature, I believe, are the two parameters we're using there. So that same framework has actually been put into something called um, tar spotter. So we're using that same framework, but look, using it to look at tar spot. Um, and we did send out a, a beta version just to a few industry folk um, this season to have a look with. I didn't really want to overly promote that just because it's a new tool and I don't want to be you know, completely wrong and have you all freaking out and spraying when you shouldn't be spraying. Um, but I'd be really curious to see what our um, industry colleagues think of that, um, that tool this year. Um, and we're continuing to refine that. Uh, so Cheryl had a question. <clears throat> this is kind of more of a garden type question, but it's a good reminder for us. Uh, she says, I've been getting a lot of mushrooms in my garden and uh, thinking it came from the mulch. Is there a product listed to get rid of that? And Marty uh, gave us all a reminder that uh, most of the fungus that we see out in the field, uh, they're beneficials. And so uh, not all of them need to uh, have a fungicide application. And so uh, he said, just uh, be aware of that. And, and again, Marty, feel free to chime in and add anything as I'm going through some of the- Yeah, I mean, some people even inoculate mulch, right? To get mushroom production to eat, so. I wouldn't really be too worried about mushrooms um, on mulch. And Bruce uh, asked, uh, given the few years we have seen tar spot in the field, is there an advantage to early planting corn? How early in the season have we seen significant disease development? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, I don't think there's, really, I don't think you're going to escape, you know, tar spot or planting early, right? Um, and I don't think changing uh, maturity of corn would help either, Sh choosing a shorter day uh, variety. Um, 
I don't think you're necessarily going to escape that much disease. It's really dependent on the weather conditions, right? So if we get a lot of moisture events, that's just going to drive disease, and that's really what it comes down to. Um, I think far more important than that is trying to find, speaking to your seed dealer and trying to identify varieties or hybrids that have um, better resistance than, you know, than what you might currently be growing. Um, and we're all learning a lot. And um, we've learned a lot the last couple of years about that, but um, I think that's, that's, that'd be, you know, it'd be a lot more important than trying to, trying to get things in a couple of days earlier. I don't really think that's going to do much for us. I have another question. What is the beta version of the tar spotter model suggesting for pressure right now? I think it was showing high risk earlier, uh, very, very early uh, in the season, you know, too early really to make a fungicide application. Um, and the risk had decreased, obviously, with all that dry, dry weather that we'd got. And I think things peaked back up a little bit with some of those moisture events that we had come through. Uh, and I'm sure if, you know, if, you know, just talking about being potentially a little bit drier coming up here, it's, it's going to, you know, hold steady or potentially drop a little bit. Um, the thing that is happening, though, it's a dynamic process, right? So now we're getting um, more lesions uh, developing. Um, you know, the, the tar spot is sort of progressing potentially. And so as we, as we come into August and we, we get, you know, if we do get more dew events at night, that's going to continue to sort of amplify the disease. So anyway, the, the, the beta version, yeah, has been sort of showing fairly low risk um, so far. Uh, how does tar spot vary within a field? How spread out should scouting be? Yeah, that's a great question, right? Corn's sort of difficult to scout. It can certainly vary, like all diseases, you know, they tend to be patchy in a field, not uniform. Um, so, I mean, you do want to cover, I would probably try and cover more fields than one field really well. The places I would go as well to really sort of, you know, if I was going to a particular farm and trying to look for it, I'd be going to areas where we've had corn on corn, might be slightly higher risk there, looking for uh, low lying fields that hold moisture, river bottom fields, um, and tree lines tend to, develop near tree lines, we tend to see the greatest amount of tar spot develop just because we hold moisture in the canopy for longer in the day, right? Um, but I think you just want to scout as much as you can. Uh, we certainly found drones to be somewhat helpful as well. Uh, unfortunately, that's at a time when things are bad, right? If you can see it from a, with a drone, things are really already pretty bad, but it could give you a sense if you're trying to make a plan for harvesting as well, like which fields, you know, where do we have lodging potential? Uh, maybe get a drone up and see where, where tar spot may have taken off in the field. Marty, I think you've answered this already uh, kind of in addressing some other questions, but I'll read this anyway. Early in the growing season, we had extreme heat and dry. It's been said earlier that tar spot prefers a moderate climate. How would the precipitation and cooler weather impact the potential for tar spot? Uh, yeah, I mean, so as soon as we, we get cooler weather with more moisture events, it's just going to amplify the risk of tar spot. Pretty simple. Um, you know, irrigation is a really big driver as well. So if we're if we're irrigating, especially if we're putting on you know really frequent applications, you know, multiple times a week, then we're at a much higher risk as opposed to you know um, larger amounts of water but less often. So that's a very important thing to think about. Um, and as I said, Lyndon Kelly uh, is available to sort of have some discussion on that as well. And we're going to cover irrigation, I think, in a couple of weeks in another breakfast here as it impacts disease development. So I know we've only had this disease around for a few years. Um, can you speak to this at all? If you have a period of time in the season, let's say, you know, late June or, or even into July, where we do have weather that's more conducive to tar spot and then things dry up, uh, have you ever seen it kind of walk back? So if no. it is able to flare up and then once it's there, then, no then the weather sort of um, uh, stops it in its tracks later on. Sure. I mean, I think that's, we have, I haven't seen that, no. So I, I think, yeah, I mean, if, if it's flared up to a point, I, you know, I would be concerned that it's got the potential to explode. So I, I think one of the really sort of, to me, one of the really significant things with tar spot is it has the potential to explode. So if you have quite a bit of disease already sort of developed, we've got the potential for an explosion in a couple of weeks, right? And, and I'm talking about, you know, you're going from alive plants to dead in, in, um, you know, in, in about four weeks' time. So 
um, again, you know, with a lot of moisture. Um, so it, it's not going to walk backwards. It may certainly be suppressed and sort of sit there and not do a great deal if it's very dry. If it's that dry, we're also probably going to have some other issues that we'd be more concerned about and probably be wishing for rain anyway. Great. All right. Um, so I just want to, before we get into the rest of the questions, just want to alert everyone. Uh, for those of you who have been kind of following what MSU Extension is doing this summer, uh, obviously all of our programming has been driven um, online. And so uh, several different groups within Extension have been planning virtual field days. Uh, you may have caught the one uh, for wheat earlier in uh, last month, and then also the um, there was another one just last week on manure management. And so Dr. Chilvers and several of the other specialists uh, will be coming together and doing one specifically for corn. I'll be coming up on September 9th, and that will be, uh, a lot of it will be talking about, really going more in depth on tar spot and uh, some of the work that uh, Dr. Chilvers has been doing. And then the other specialists will be talking about uh, some of the unevenness that we're seeing this year in our corn crop. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, just take a look at, uh, just go on to the MSU Extension website and check out uh, virtual field days. And you'll actually be able to see all the different offerings um, that different groups are working on. So I'm just going to go back to the chat box for now. Uh, again, if you're still on the call and you've got a question for anyone, any of the specialists, feel free to type those in. Uh, and, and Marty, you already addressed this, but I'll read it again. Uh, hybrid sensitivity to tar spot varies widely. However, a lot of the company variety plot growers uh, could look at the fields, uh, likely to get at least one to two fungicide applications applied. Are there trials out there that are dedicated to looking at hybrids without fungicide applications? Yeah, there are. So uh, Manny Singh runs the MSU corn performance trials, uh, and some of those locations don't get a fungicide. Um, and even those that do get a fungicide, right, if it is applied at R1, it might be too early and we'll have an epidemic come through anyway. Um, so we'll be rating those. We also do uh, private variety screening for companies. Um, this year we're doing that at Decatur, Michigan, um, under irrigation. So uh, for us, it's going to be a good location to really push, uh, push varieties and see how they perform. Um, so, yeah, there certainly are, um, yeah if it's underway to, to screen material. All right, uh, can you expand on suggestions of treatment timing for tar spot? More thoughts on action thresholds for other diseases as well. Yeah, so we don't want to forget about, you know, northern leaf blight is often a very big one for us, uh, especially more northern Michigan, and then um, gray leaf spot in the south. We really don't want to forget about those diseases, right? Um, typically, we will see uh, the best return on investment when we see those diseases, you know, turning up on the ear leaf or above uh, and doing damage. So, you know, once we hit this sort of time and, you know, this silking sort of window, it's a really good idea to get out and scout. And if we have disease on the ear leaf or above for those diseases, we, we'd probably consider a fungicide application then and there for those, those particular diseases. Again, with tar spot, it has that potential to explode. And so we're trying to figure out what is a good threshold. Um, this season, you know, my best sort of um, guess on this is that we might have to wait until we've got maybe 50% of plants with some level of tar spot. And I'm talking about, you know, one spot would be considered, you know, the plant as being infected. So it's going to take some really uh, fine tooth, uh, uh, fine tooth comb scouting to see, you know, when tar spot is out there in the field. But that's what we're going to do. We're going to compare a standard um, R1 silking timing with the timing when we have about 50% of the plants with one lesion, one or more lesions on them, uh, and then see how that works out. Because we just have such a, a, you know, a long window to go. And again, you know, I think typically we probably get pretty reasonable control for most uh, diseases like northern leaf blight and gray leaf spot by making that application at silking. With tar spot, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And we may need to be delaying that, that fungicide application until blister or, or some other growth stage. So um, that's what we're really trying to key in on this season. So we've got our first bug question come in. So uh, Chris Afonso with her 
super cool blue gamer headphones is on here. Uh, somebody's asking about Western bean cutworm counts. And for those of you who can see the chat, she's got something in here. But Chris, tell us a little bit about what's going on with Western bean. So the Great Lakes and Maritimes network is showing um, catch in the last couple of weeks. There are some traps now that are active in Michigan. I know there's some other people that are trapping that haven't got those traps in yet. There's a little glitch if you're using a computer. You have to put your information in uh, again every single week. So save your GPS coordinates to, in order to re-enter re those. If you're using the app, however, uh, so some people were able to download the app on their phone. That's working, I guess, better. So I had just a couple, maybe I think five in my traps last week. Paul Gross is reporting like 40 to 50 um, this week. So I'm going to check my traps again today. Um, so I know flight is starting to pick up, but I walked a lot of corn on Tuesday uh, just around campus that I would have laid eggs in if I was a Western Bean cutworm, but I didn't find any any eggs yet. So sometimes, you know, there has to be mating and then those egg batches are, are created depending on where you are. Maybe further south, they're starting to see some, some, some egg masses. If it does get really dry, you know, these, these moths need at least water. They don't actually eat plants at this point as an adult, but they do need water to create eggs. So, you know, if it gets super dry in your area and there's no irrigation and there's no place for them to get water, sometimes that can actually reduce egg laying. But, you know, this morning when I drove in, it was extremely foggy. Uh, also, you have irrigation in some places. So if they can pick up water, then they will make egg masses. I also saw a corn borer egg mass. So uh, that would be second generation uh, starting. That was up in Saginaw Valley Farm. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, let's spread this out a little bit. Uh, if a grower will be spraying one time for white mold, at what time during flower development should they spray? Uh, down here where uh, I would say most of our soybean fields are, are flowering, some are even into uh, R3. You know, so fungicide applications need to occur to protect the flowers, right? So R1, beginning of flower, when we've got um, an open flower on 50% or more of the plants, through to R3, which is when we've got um, a quarter inch pod on um, the top four nodes, I believe. I would split the difference, I guess, um, if you weren't sure as to when to make that timing and probably go for an R2 timing. So when we've got flowers on the top two nodes um, of the soybean plant, that's probably when I personally would make that fungicide application if I didn't have any other information um, to go on. Again, I would also be running that Sporecaster app um, and having a look at how you know, how disease pressure is or how the risk of white mold apothecia is for this year um, and, and use that to potentially make a judgment call as well. And if it's low at the start um, of flowering, once we hit R1, I might hold off and I might wait and watch, see how things are developing, and then maybe put it on, you know, maybe at R3, right, if, if we do actually get some, some rainfall come through and, and create wetter conditions. Eric, I did have a comment about uh, potato leaf hopper. I know we've had lots of reports on hopper burn in alfalfa and probably dry beans. And there's an actually an article that uh, should be coming out either today or tomorrow talking about some of the thresholds on potato leaf hoppers. But I, I would like to ask Chris uh, about how long does it take for the fungi that get into these fields to actually uh, break down these populations of potato leaf hopper. So there are beneficial fungi that are just sort of naturally out there, either on the plant surfaces or on the soil surfaces. Uh, there's fungi that attack aphids, like grain aphids or even soybean aphids. There's one called neozygites that I can remember. There's some that attack spider mite, and there's some that attack potato leaf hopper. Um, from my work on soybean aphid, when soybean aphid was bad, we were taking aphids and you could actually put them into a moist environment and the fungi would like burst out of them, you know, like in 24 hours. But they were previously infected. The spores must have already been there. So I think once fungi are there, it's pretty quick on the individual that is infected. But I don't know the details of... Uh, I mean, we're not talking weeks. I, I, I think it would be like a week or something, like 
like that. But you need extended humidity under a canopy, not humid in the morning for an hour and then the canopy dries up. Uh, you need sort of that 24 to 48 hours, those white mold sort of conditions. I can remember when I worked in the Red River Valley, uh, there was a huge aphid outbreak on, on wheat. And uh, I mean, it, uh, hundreds and hundreds of aphids per wheat head. It was unbelievable. And uh, that outbreak within a week, once the conditions flipped, it just wiped those aphids out. It was spectacular. So fungi are tremendously bad when they're attacking your plant, like tar spot or white mold. But the, the, the other side of the coin is if you're a little insect and you get infected, it can ha with the right conditions, you're dead. So I really danced around that. I didn't actually give you an answer. You <laughs> noticed that, right? That was good, Chris. I know. I noticed it. Because <laughs> you have gray hair like I do. No, actually, I, that the leafhopper question is a good one because the populations are so high, and usually it, it feels like it's mid-August before we get those declines in populations. I think that's kind of what Phil yeah. was getting at. And, and there's a lot on soybean, too. I was out in the soybean field, and there's – and. Soybean can take a lot of leaf hoppers, but I can see some, some like the lower leaves look like maybe there's a little bit of hopper burn. But regular commercial soybean does not get the kind of damage that you see on, on like a dry bean. I wanted to ask Chris something. I was out scouting for tar spot yesterday in several irrigated fields and saw tons and tons of little grasshoppers and big grasshoppers. Yep, I should have mentioned that too. I have taken some great pictures of grasshopper feeding, and they're about half grown. So they're not even, they're maybe like the teenagers now. The one thing about grasshoppers is I think they're probably pretty tasty. So a lot of things eat them and consume them. I saw dragonflies, like tons of dragonflies working the edges of these fields. And I think that what they were getting were grasshoppers. I've never seen a field defoliated like you, like you have reports in the West where they talk about grasshopper damage where things just get eaten. I think we're far enough along, but it is kind of interesting. Uh, after grasshoppers, you then get blister beetles. And I have seen a couple people sending me pictures of blister beetles because blister beetle larvae consume grasshopper egg masses, which are in the soil. So the blister beetle larvae is uh, beneficial. And the adult, for those with hay, hay production, uh, could, could see some issues. Um, on the field crop entomology website, I actually have a, a handout that shows the different species of blister beetles and their uh, content of cantharidin or the blistering compound, which can be a problem in livestock. But usually you think about that as later in the season or next year where these populations of blister beetles have been generated on this grasshopper food, essentially. So that's something I'll think about for next year, perhaps. And if that's of interest, I can send that out uh, or a link. That'd be good, Chris, to send that out. Maybe next week I can show it if you remind me. Sure. So Chris, just to clarify, we had somebody ask, uh, did you say that dragonflies are eating and killing these grasshoppers? Well, there's huge dragonfly populations this year. More than one person has sent me a, a, a message about that. And there are predators, things that fly up, they zoom in and grab them. And I think if a grasshopper flew, uh, it's not, they're not going to get the grasshopper on the plant, but they would get anything that is flying in that, in that, uh, on that field edge where they're kind of hunting. I'm not saying that, you know, they're going to control them. There's tons of grasshoppers out there. So, but it's kind of a curiosity. Uh, Bruce says there's epic levels of dragonflies epic. down in the southwest here. Yeah, they're co pretty cool. All right. I think with that, it's after 8 o'clock. I think we'll call that a day. So thank you very much, uh, Marty and Jeff, and for everyone else who chimed in. And we'll see you guys back here uh, next week for the virtual breakfast with Dean Botts.